I'm Hemant Sharma, and I think I've met m most of you during the course. And what I'm going to talk about is about the surgical technique for the uh, plates uh, after the, you have corrected the deformity with the fixator in uh, femur and tibia. Now, this is the downside that following Durai that he always does his thing so well. So I can promise you my talk will not be as good as his. Right? But hopefully, I'll be able to give you some salient, uh, uh, some salient features. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some steps as, as I do it. And that doesn't mean that is the only way. There are a number of ways people do it differently. You, everybody finds their own technique. And in my technique, I do it this way, and I feel it uh, comfortable. And uh, any problems, tips, and tricks we'll be discussing later on in the end of the talk. So therefore, I will not be talking about them in, the, in this talk. So let's start with the position. A very simple thing. Uh, the patient needs to be supine, obviously, because we're doing uh, generally all the things we need to do. We will do it, uh, which is uh, all the approaches are easier than supine. We need to put a sandbag. Now, we need to be sure that sandbag means the idea is that patient's knees facing forward. So when you're putting on any device, although you can control the rotation by the fixator, but still, patella facing forward gives you the alignment how we are used to see a leg and how we fix the leg. So just be careful because if the sandbag is too big, then patient can tilt. And if it tilts, that's fine with that. But you need to put a support on the other side so patient doesn't slide off that of the sandbag. So, so that is important. You should have a, either a pelvic table, which is totally radiolucent, or if you're going to put a st standard table, then the longer end should be at the bottom. And make sure before you scrub that the radiographer is there and they can check the hip under X-ray. Because sometimes what happens is that you can't see the hip and then your long leg alignment is not possible and you struggle. And sometimes, if you really get stuck, then what you can do, can do is you can tilt the angle a little bit. It, it's not good for, for a lot of things, but for alignment, it's fine. Because once you tilt, your table is finishing here. You tilt it, and then you can move a little bit more. So that way, you can get the alignment just in case we get stuck. But this should be checked well before uh, you scrub. You should put the intensifier in a way so the lateral comes under the table. Right? So it's easier, otherwise if it comes on the top of the table, it's always been your way. Right? So do that, so image identifies should we come under the table. And before you do anything, we always just to, is a, to remind you that osteotomy rules are critical here, because we often don't do the osteotomy at the desired site or the cora, or the apex of the deformity, which basically means that you will end up some obligatory translation. And therefore, it is very important that we uh, remember the osteotomy rules and pre-plan it. How do you do it? It's actually quite simple few steps. You put a ring or fixator, whatever you're, you, you're using, align it to each respective segments. Right? Take your time, because this is the critical bit. Align the each ring to its respective segment and while you're doing that, you will also know where you're going to do your core eyes, where you're going to do osteotomy. So mark that, and once you have aligned your frame, that's the most critical bit, because then you know, excuse me, that what you are, uh, the how it will correct. Once you have done that, finish the osteotomy, check the alignment, do a temporary stabilization, means put in a plate or a nail, and check your al alignment again, and then, Re, uh, recheck the alignment and then finish your fixation. Because there's a tendency sometimes, and that too because I have done it, I put in a plate, finish the plate, and then realize I've slightly undercorrected it. And then you have to take the screws out and redo it. That's not, so if you're putting in a plate, put one screw on each side, check the alignment again, make sure everything is right, and then uh, complete the fixation. If you're putting a pin and a wire or a half pin, put it opposite side of the plate, and put proximal to it. In certain situations, you can do within the range, but stay away from the implant. So whatever implant you have decided to choose doesn't come in your way of your external and internal fixation, right? 
And this is just an example from the top that how you align the fragment. And if you see each ring, there is your hinge, there's a cora, uh, and there's a hinges there. This is aligned to the distal segment, this is aligned to proximal. Now you may align it to anatomical axis in femur or mechanical axis, doesn't matter. But what you correct has to be the mechanical axis. So if you're doing anatomical, you will enter some translation. You have to overcorrect it because the axis, what you're looking for is the mechanical axis correction. And there's the same view from the side. And what you have done is, I've left this space for putting in a plate. So two third ring distally, two third proximally will give you enough space to put your plate, whichever side you're going to do in medial or lateral, whichever side plate you put in. So how I do it, so, so this is the leg, and I start marking things. This is my joint line. This is my distal end of plate, which I've decided which I'm going to go under X-ray control. Then this is the, my osteotomy site. It may, may not be at the cora. Osteotomitis, osteotomy site is where I have enough segment to put in uh, enough screws or fixation to stabilize the distal segment. So it may, may not be at the apex of the deformity. And then I've decided, that I'm going to go, have a six hole plate, but just in case if I get things wrong, I've also marked the eight hole plate so that I have a bit of a, a leeway in my fixation. Then you put two two third rings and you put it in the waist because the medial side you don't want to impinge, so this goes proximally and this you want to leave the space on the lateral side to put your plate on because this is a varus deformity. Then what you need to do is, uh, to, 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 you need to plan it in a way, check it on the, uh, on the leg before you go ahead. So put it on, check it under intensifier. And one of the things about fixator-assisted internal fixation is that don't rush, because you only get one chance to do it. Once the patient comes out post-operatively, there's no remedy or no going back to correct it. So you need to take your time and get it right the first time. So, so, so let me run through this example of, of a 17-year-old or 19-year-old young man, fit and well, ha, had a growth plate injury when he was young. And he had type uh, four injury of the distal femur, and he ended up with some deformity, and this is a result of, previous, of the previous fixation. So this is the planning. Now this is my hinge. This is how I planned it, I marked my uh, plate where it's going to go, I mark my joint, I mark my plate, and or, so everything what you plan, now the, on the medial side, pins are on the medial side because I'm going to put the plate on the laterally, so you plan it accordingly and then get it, uh, so you have clear space and full access to what you want to do. And the, 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 this is not from this patient, this is a different patient, so again just to uh, just to remind you that, uh, sorry, it's gone, yeah. So this is the picture, so this is, you see, this is, in a, uh, this is the valgus deformity, and all you need to do is correct the hinge. Now, if you put the hinge at the apex of the deformity, it will automatically translate and get you what you, get what you want to. You do not have to translate it uh, manually. And this is another patient which showed, as I showed you before, to mark the axis of the each segment. Each ring should be put, put, put perpendicular to each segment. Now, here what I've decided, I'm going to put the hinge at the convex side. So it's important to decide whether you're going to do a, a neutral hinge or opening wedge. Because if you're not doing an opening wedge, you might need some length, otherwise it will impinge. So putting your hinge at the convex side is very useful because what it does is it gives you, uh, it opens it up and without any impingement. So you have to take your time to align your, your fixation under intensifier control again to make sure that it is, your hinge is at the, at the right place. Then you put in the axis, this is a diathermy method. So you put your center of the hip to the center of the ankle, should pass from the center of the knee where you wanted it. You might put in the center of the knee, you might overcorrect it depending on the age. You might want to do HDO type of deformity correction if somebody is young. So there are many ways of doing it, but all has to be, has to be pre planned. And this is the pre op, this is the post op, and oops. And so if you see, we have corrected the lateral axis to the center as we want it. 
So this is, so as long as we take our time, we do it, it's, it's quite, uh, it's reasonably straightforward. It's a bit fiddly, but the steps are important and consistently a plan is important. Now, I also use a navigation with it. Now, there is no separate platform available for it. All knee, all knee replacement companies make a platform for high table osteotomy, but uh, may, may not, but definitely they make it for a navigated knee replacement. You can use the same software. I use Bbron because that's in my hospital. No other reason for that. And here, what I've done is, is a patient where, if you see these are the, these are the markers for the navigation, and if you see the pins are uh, on the medial side, uh, sorry, proximally, and on the medial side, and the medial side, there's a marker. So one marker, so one tracker is in distal segment, one tracker is the proximal segment. Now what it does is, it gives you an additional uh, uh, way to identify your access, uh, sorry, your mechanical access or your alignment, and just helps you further. So this is a patient where we started with a, with a bit of virus, and it says pre-cut mechanical access, so you know when it's pre and post. Uh, and you can check it actually on table, and then when you do that, you say, I'm going to put in slight valgus because I want to put the access not on the medial tibial spine, but in the center of the knee. So, or maybe slightly lateral. So it gives you an additional advantage and additional way to identify your access and, uh, and correct the deformity. And there's the same patient, we corrected it, and there's a, once you remove the fixator, it looks much cleaner and nicer, right? So this is the final one. Now, I'm going to also introduce a unico assisted deformity correction. It's a unico, is a unilateral, unicortical pin, and the advantage of that is that you can do nail and plate while it's on, because, it, sorry, nail, because it doesn't come in the way. So you don't, so you, you have slight more leeway. Now what it does is these angles are fixed, but you can change it to an extent. And I think Dora, you tested it biomechanically, isn't it? Uh, initially when it was launched. And so there are, it all comes in the two types of, uh, pin has got a cortical and a, and a cancellous thread. And this is something really nice, it's a torque limiter. So you can drill it, you cannot over drill it. It will only go that far and it, it will change the sound when you stop. The only caution is that in the cancellous bone and the, when the bone is soft, it sometimes goes uh, too much and then you have to bring it back to the marker. So just a caution, but otherwise, it's, it's a lovely fixator. And, uh, and in fact, we tested it uh, a, a while ago and I think uh, uh, me and Ross were operating and it took us about between 12 to 15 minutes to put on the entire fixator. Because you don't have to mark the hinge, you don't have to place the hinge where you want, so it's an advantage because you could put the fixator very quickly, so it saves you a lot of time uh, if you ha have at your disposal. And this is what comes in everything pre-packed, single use, right? And everything, so it's, it's actually one of the other way to easy way to use it. The advantage, as I said, you can, uh, you can ream it, you can nail it, anything with the fixator on. If you have a hip replacement, long stem doesn't matter because you put it on top of it and it's, it's still be fine. It, it, it doesn't do that. Now, the only thing is, as I said, that when the bone is soft, uh, you got to be careful and because occasionally it can go in, so you have to pull it back. The second thing is, and this is absolutely crucial, we all have a tendency, we put in a pin and we do this, this looks good. Don't do that, it's a unicortical. If you do it, it will become loose. You have to reinsert the pin at a different place. So it's quite important, trust the fixator, put the four pins, lock it, and, and, and believe me, it stays. You can lift the leg with it, and it's quite stable. If you don't trust me, ask Mr. Nayagam, he has tested it bi biomechanically. So, 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 so this is a patient, again an example is a valgus deformity, as you can see, and the idea would be to, uh, uh, to fix it as an internal fixation. This is a planning that this are going to do. And uh, so again, as usual, I mark every leg to see how, how I'm going to do it. And then once I'm marked, I'm quite, I'm, uh, I love dome osteotomy. So uh, this is the pin for the dome, and, and I've created the, my holes, and I left it as such. And then once I've done that, I think we, we, we did it in, in our group in the, uh, yesterday. 
So, so you put in a fixator, so you do this, take the pin out, and then put in your fixator. This is an example how to do the dome. And once you have done that, you put a fixator, then complete the osteotomy, because then it will be stable, and you can control it much better. I'm, I'm sorry about this picture. Only I realized when I projected it that I should have cleaned the leg. So my apologies for that. <laughs> but, but as you can see, I put in a fixator. And once I put in a fixator, I check the alignment with the, uh, with the diathermy. I still also have a navigation here. here. So the trackers for navigation, so I check with both. And then once I've got it straight, what you do is you can lock it. And how to check it? Put again the center of the knee, center of the ankle, and should pass from the center of the knee where you intended to correct it. If you translate it, you have to do it manually because there is no mechanism as in hinges to, to do it. So you have to manually translate it. So, uh, the, uh, so, the, so this is the finished product in the sense that once you, have, uh, once you have finished it, all you have to do is put this rod and just, uh, uh, just tighten it, it will hold. The difference is hinge is a constraint co uh, correction as, uh, um, uh, as Mikhail explained this morning, and Unico is unconstrained correction, so you need to be slightly careful with it because it can do a little bit more than you intended. So just be slightly careful about it. Once you've done it, you check your axis, put in a plate, and this is the pre-op, it comes the post-op there, and there's your axis, and this is the final pictures. So it's a, another way for you to, another device in your ornamentarium to, to do this if you wish to. And as an advantage, there's a patient with a total hip, and you see, they're not even touching the stem. So it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a lovely device uh, from that point of view. And again, as I showed, you, you, you can nail it through there when the fixator is on. So just a quick word about the T-bill plating, and then I'm, I'm finished. So T-bill plating, so this is an example. I, we, um, we did actually, actually two weeks ago, actually, because I thought I should have some example properly uh, do it. I don't have the, the, that good pictures. So if you plan it, so if you see your axis is, if you plan it from the tibia, your, your apex of the deformity is there. It's about five degrees of virus. But since he's young, I really want to correct it to the lateral tibial spine. So I'm going to correct the deformity plus doing H2 at the same time. So when you plan it that way, suddenly your deformity increases to 10 and your apex of the deformity is actually moved up. So when you correct the leg, your bone segment is important, but whole leg is important actually as well. So you need to plan it so your axis is, is corrected that way. So, so like we do, we, 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 we mark the leg, we constructed the hinge. We didn't have enough equipment, so I have to just make do things there. So my apologies about that. Uh, so you make the hinge because the, the issue is the hinge is 60 millimeter proximal from your osteotomy site. We, we, we measured it and we decided that. So what you do is you have to shift the hinge proximally that far so your hinge is at the apex of the deformity and it will automatically translate. So you do that, plan the hinge, and then all you have to do is uh, put on the fixator. And once you put on the fixator, you can just align each ring to, to its respective segment. And, and, and once you have done that, you can, you, you, you can finish your osteotomy and correct it. So I didn't use the navigation. So this is the uh, method with the long rod is there, and this is the diathermy method. So I wanted to correct it the, in the lateral tibial spine, which is the aim, because I want to slightly overcorrect it and offload the medial compartment. And then once I've done that, corrected it, checked, and so we, 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 uh, we double plated it because I was slightly worried it might hinge back and I might lose a bit of my correction because there's a tendency for sometimes for uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, re rebound because the, if you don't have a plate stiff enough and you use a standard uh, locking plates from any company, the way they're designed, they're very good for fractures. But when there is a muscle forces, are, they can be a little bit difficult and there's a slight tendency of rebound in them. So you've got to be slightly careful in those. And this is the uh, picture, we two plates in there. And this is the pre-op picture. 
and this is the post stop, and this is the access. And, and this is what we planned, and this is what we achieved. Maybe a couple of millimeters or less translation that I intended, and that is because I probably didn't put my hinge properly. If I put my hinge properly, it would have done that much. And I'm probably a couple of millimeters less than I originally intended. So that's, so that's the importance that you need to put your hinge properly. And on, in theater, it looked fine, so we left it. But we, we, actually, we did try to manipulate it and, uh, and hold it with, uh, with, with extra support. So steps would be, so your pre-op checklist is you need to plan. And planning you need to do is you need to look at where you're going to correct it, where your osteotomy is, and how much translation you're going to get. And from, and from there, you need to look at it that where will the fragments go, what implant you're going to use, all that is pre-planning. Then you look at it, what I'm going to use my nail or a plate, and how big is the jig, where I'm going to put my external fixator, will it come in each other's way? If, and if you're not sure, then take a saw bone and plan it and play with it and then do it. Because some, uh, 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 some j j jigs are compatible in the sense they don't come in each other's way and others do. When you start with surgery, always mark the length of the uh, internal device. I do also do fibular osteotomy because there's a translation. If there's no translation and you're not doing bigger correction, then perhaps you do not need to do fibular osteotomy. Uh, but if you have any translation, then perhaps it's a good idea. Where you do it is a bit different. A lot of people do it distally, although it's, uh, if you do proximally at the, uh, not far away from the osteotomy, translation becomes a little bit easier. Uh, then pre delay osteotomy, apply your X fix, complete the osteotomy and then put it on your plate. Put in your plate, put two screws, one on each, each segment, recheck your alignment, and if it's still fine, complete your fixation. If you're in the tibia, you're not sure, either put two plates or think of slight overcorrection because there's a slight tendency of, of rebound at times. To summarize, uh, what I would say is that principles what you learned in the last three days is critical. The idea of the last three days is that so you be in a position to assess all this and you do not create a secondary deformity. That's the principal aim of, of the course. Pre-planning is absolutely crucial in terms of your implant, in terms of where you're going to do it, the translation, the neurovascular structures, how much acute you're going to correct it, you're going to release the nerves. There's a lot of things, all the things that Gavin told this morning are, are, are very, very critical. And if you don't get it right, that's it. There's no second bite at the cherry. Thank you so much. And just to, before you go, um, please let everybody know that next year's course is already half full. So if they want to come, please let us know well in advance so we can book them because this year we have to say no to a lot of people. So, and we don't want to do that. And secondly, there's a lovely meeting in South Africa if you want to go. Uh, if you speak to your orthofix rep nicely, I'm sure they'll help you. Thank you very much.